Good morning, Mrs. McBride. How are you today? How's that handsome husband of yours doing? Good. Oh, I'm sorry. The microphone was on. <laughs> Good morning. I welcome you. Those of you who are visiting can see we're a very serious church. We try to be, but uh, it, it's so great to be together. Um, Mary, did you get your Bible? Oh, great. Okay. Thank you. Um, I want to greet our visitors, especially, and those of you who have been visitors in recent weeks, weeks but you've come back. Um, Katie, where did you sit? K Katie, welcome. Good to see you. And Paula. Paula. Now we have two Paulas. No, Bill, not your wife, Paula. <laughs> Paula, have you met Paula? Paula? Paula. Paula? Paula. <laughs> And Barbara Topolovich. See, she, she told me her last name, and I was so proud of myself. I mean, Topolovich, Topolovich. And I went back and said, I'm sorry, I remember Topolovich, but I don't remember your first name. And <laughs> she said, it's Barbara. Remember, like, you said your mother's name was Barbara? <laughs> so, Barbara, you are my new best friend. Welcome. Good to have you with us. Yeah. Any other visitors whom I may have missed? Okay, we have a number of winter visitors. Well, I think all of our winter visitors, not all of them are gone yet. Oh, that's right. Well, any, any others who are winter visitors, you're not allowed to leave after last week. <laughs> so you're ours. Anyway, welcome. Yeah. Just want to mention um, this every um, Lord's, the first Lord's Day of every month we have the Lord's table and we also m make a note that we have a benevolence offering. We don't take an offering here. We have the box and we do understand um, giving is an act of worship. We don't minimize it. We just make it available. Um, as far as the benevolence offering, there's a little box on the table in the back. If, if anybody would like to give special toward that, that's what we use to help people who have Unex usually unexpected needs that come up. Typically as part of our church family, but quite often also we'll have people stop in and they have legitimate needs and we, we try to help meet those needs as well. And that's all through God's um, graciousness and generosity through you. So I just mentioned that this morning. Um, also tonight we're going to continue our series on exalting Jesus. And every week we're taking an aspect of either his, his names, his, his character traits, his, um, his office. Tonight, Jesus, the Savior. What does that mean? I mean, we know it. If you're a Christian, you know what it means in terms of application to your life. But, but theologically, biblically, just, just what does that all entail? And we'll look at that together again tonight. So with that, I do invite you to stand, please. And we're going to sing. This is Hymn number 55, if you'd like to follow along in the hymnal, number 55, Immortal, Invisible, and then after we worship God through this song, please remain standing for prayer. bow with me. Our Heavenly Father, it, it really is um, almost overwhelming to think that we can at this very moment 
come into the presence through our Lord Jesus Christ into your throne room through, as the writer of Hebrews says, through the veil of his flesh, that veil torn when Jesus Christ died on the cross. And now we have access into the holy of holies in heaven itself through him. And we worship you, Father. We exalt you. We lift up your name. We exalt the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and it's our desire in this corporate worship to give you praise, to give him praise, to unite our hearts and our spirits and our voices in worshiping you in song and through prayer and through um, the ministry of your word, and then, of course, Lord Jesus, at your table. I pray that even now we would be preparing our hearts to worship you unhindered by known sin and with hearts that are fixed on you through love in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And then he said to his disciples and to others, I'm leaving. I'm paraphrasing. I'm leaving. You now are the light of the world as you reflect the light of truth salt and light to the world. This song acknowledges the fact that Jesus is, in fact, the light of the world. It is hymn number 287, 287. We will sing all three verses. The light of the world is Jesus. Now, is this a new song to any of you? Is it a new song to all of you? <laughs> Verse 2, the light of the world is Jesus. No, no darkness has we who in Jesus abide. The light of the world is Jesus. We walk in the light when we follow our guide. The light of the world is Jesus. Come to shining for thee, sweetly the light has dawned upon me. Once I was blind, but now I see. The light of the world is Jesus. No need of the sunlight in heaven, we're told. The light of that world is Jesus. Shining for thee, sweetly the light has dawned upon me. Once I was blind, but now I see. The light of the world is Jesus. Well, you did very well with that. And it was a song, of course, to Jesus, who is the truth. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the light. That's what we proclaim. That's what we experience. And that's what we attempt to shine as we live for him. This next song is, Look ye saints, the sight is glorious. This may be one that you don't know either. I didn't know it. I'm learning it. Uh, maybe you know it. it it's, it's an old hymn. It's been around for a long time. It is hymn number 247, if you'd like to follow along uh, with the music. Hymn number 247. 47, look, ye saints, the sight is glorious. Become the 
song or a new old song. <clears throat> a hymn that's going to be familiar. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. It's all in his wonderful face. But we've, we've uh, changed some of the lyrics and added a chorus to it, which may be unfamiliar as well. So we have a whole bunch of new songs this morning we share with you. But um, we're going to just introduce verse 2 and the chorus part. Then Dennis will have us stand with that. But just also want to keep note on the on the last chorus part. There is going to be a, a whole. Dennis is going to lead that as well. So we're coming together as we sing with the song. Turn your eyes. I'd like you to stand, please.
seated. Rick, thank you for introducing it to us. Let's do it again next week and maybe the next couple of weeks to really get it down solid. Besides, I want to sing it again. I invite you to turn in your Bibles, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. We're looking at the entire chapter. We started in what I titled uh, uh, Preferring One Another, part one last week where we did a background study of what, what Scripture means by preferring one another in love. And now we're going to look at Paul's specific illustration in chapter 8 of 1 Corinthians. And this is a principle that, that impacts all of us. Um, the specific illustration has to do with Jews and Gentile Christians eating or not eating meat sacrificed to idols. That's not an issue to us normally. Um, but the principle is an issue to us. It's something that we need to be very aware of in terms of there there are freedoms, liberties that we have in Christ. I'm not going to list them, but but we, and we all experience them. And sometimes those liberties can offend other Christians because their consciences aren't there yet. For them, it's offensive. We're not talking about blatant sins. We're talking about preferences or things that people, because of their their background, grew up really sensitized to. Now, I I grew up in the the 50s and the 60s. In the 50s, there were a lot of things that that professing Christians were sensitive to, like going to movies or shopping on Sunday or, you know, those kinds of things that weren't biblical issues. It depends on what the movie was, I guess until the Ten Commandments came along, and then it shattered that whole perspective. But anyway, um, those kinds of things that were preferential, and some, many Christians, because of their theological perspective or their Christian community or whatever, were highly sensitive to those and could easily be offended by other Christians who had freedom in Christ to, to do those things because they weren't biblical issues. And I'm trying deliberately to talk in generalities, but these things we interact with, especially in a church community, um, it extends beyond the church, but, but the principles, again, all that to say, the principles are important for us to understand. There's always opportunities to defer to one another in love, to set aside something that we may deserve. I, I rarely use that word, but I mean, even biblically, something that is okay for us to do. We have the freedom to do that And yet, for the sake of a brother or sister in Christ, we set it aside. We prefer to show deference to them, show preference to them. That's what Paul is after here. The specific illustration has to do with eating meat sacrificed to idols, as you'll see as we go through the passage. But the principle goes way beyond that. So I just wanted to set that up so that you who weren't here would at least know where Paul is going with this. And those of you who were here, it was just needed a reminder. I wanted to give that to you. But the passage, again, is 1 Corinthians chapter 8. I'll read the entire passage in just a few minutes. But first I want to pray, and then we'll come to God's word, and then we'll close our time of worship this morning around the Lord's table. For that's what we have in store for us in the next few minutes. But please bow with me. Our Heavenly Father, we are amazed, really, we are amazed that you and your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, preferred us, deferred to us, Lord Jesus. You set aside the full expression of your glory in heaven to take on human flesh, to be humiliated, to live a perfect life, to teach, to be persecuted even unto death, to go to the cross all in preference to us because we were lost eternally apart from your grace and apart from your sacrifice and apart from you taking upon you our sin, the great sin bearer, the savior, the only savior of the world. 
we celebrate and we praise you this morning and we will do so again around your table as you know but now when we come to this passage i pray that your spirit would teach us your spirit would convict us if necessary your spirit would tenderize us to be more preferential toward others so that they will walk more closely to you so that they would not be built up to actually sin against you help us to understand the passage and to understand how it applies to our lives because we want to serve you in preference to you and to your will in jesus name amen amen again first corinthians chapter 8 verses 1 through 13 and uh, again, I'll read the entire passage in just a minute, because in this passage, Paul gives us an illustration of what it means to defer to one another. We saw that in principle last week, and we saw a key principle, and that key principle unlocks this passage for us. And it's a simple principle, and yet it's a profound principle, and it can also be a difficult principle, because it requires us, it instructs us, it prompts us through love, to place the concerns of others ahead of our own and to do that by sacrificing quite often something that we have the freedom in Christ to enjoy or to pursue. Here's the principle. We are to prefer one another in love even if it means forfeiting a liberty that we have in Christ. We are to prefer one another in love even if it means forfeiting a liberty we have in Christ. That's the biblical principle that Paul is dealing with. The, the broader principle is that we should be people preferring others, especially other believers, whether or not it means sacrificing a freedom we have in Christ, just the fact that we can do it. Maybe we have the authority or maybe we have the resources to do something else, and yet we set that aside for the sake of encouraging or helping another believer, or even broader, uh, helping somebody else. I mean, we are still ambassadors of Christ, and the unbelieving world needs us, even if they don't understand that. They need our testimony, they need our sacrificial attitudes toward them. So this very, very broad spectrum of application of this principle. So Paul gives us this real-life illustration the question at hand, just kind of reminding you of the context historically, the question at hand was, is it a sin to eat meat sacrificed to idols? That's the question in the context. And I remind you that many early Christians, especially in places like Corinth, where, where idolatry was rampant, I mean, literally, it was part of the fabric of their lives. So, Eating meat sacrificed to idols was a very real issue, especially for Christians. They had grown up, those who were a part of the Corinthian culture, were very much into an idolatrous mindset, surrounded by idolatry and participating in idolatry, no doubt. Suddenly they are Christians. Jesus Christ is their Lord, the true God is now what they understand, who they understand to be the one and the only one to be worshipped. So is it a sin now to identify in any way with idolatry, but especially to eat meat sacrificed to idol? Their consciences were very keenly opposed now to anything having to do with idolatry, anything sacrificed to idols, especially to ingest it. And, and to corrupt or pollute my body spiritually or their body spiritually. How were they to handle that? So of particular concern was meat that had been sacrificed to idols and which was available in the local meat markets. And also the temples would have their own meat markets. But this, this meat was scattered throughout the city, throughout the culture. Um, th they never knew if they were going to eat meat that had been sacrificed or partially sacrificed to an idol. Additionally, one of the major barriers between Jews and Gentiles was the distinction between clean and unclean meats. Wherever Jews lived, 
they were required by Jewish law, not necessarily Old Testament law, but prevailing Jewish law, to have someone trained in the rules and ceremonies which enabled that person to decide and to ensure that all the meat which they would eat would be clean, not unclean. And those are technical terms within the Jewish framework, clean and unclean. According to prevailing Jewish law, Jews could not touch or consume any meat that had been certified or that was not certified as free from legal blemish or ceremonial pollution. In fact, those meats that were free from those things were labeled, literally they were stamped as, what's the word? Kosher, which means legal. Maybe you didn't know that. I didn't know it before I studied this. Kosher means legal in the Jewish sense. So they knew what was legal, but in the regular meat markets, there was no stamp. They have to go to special meat markets. Gentiles, on the other hand, were accustomed to buying meat in the markets, much of which consisted of remnants of animals that had been slain as part of sacrifices in the temple of the various idols and which were not consumed by their priests. So they, those that didn't feed the priest were then sold. And a lot of that meat made its way out into the community is the point. Therefore, the markets of Corinth in this case were stocked with meat, which had related to idol sacrifices. So if Christians were not permitted to eat meat sacrificed to idols, that means they were effectively shut out of meat markets at all, of eating meat at all, because they would never know for sure if it contained meat sacrificed to idols unless they went to the Jewish ko uh, kosher stores and literally lived under Jewish dietary restrictions, which they knew biblically had been rescinded. Even the Jews weren't held to those. Paul gives a great deal of, of writing to the fact that the Old Testament dietary laws had been replaced. They were fulfilled in Christ. The new moons, the Sabbaths, all of those ceremonies that were part of the Old Testament cultural uh, landscape were fulfilled in Christ. This was no longer an issue. Now, additionally, many Christians were poor they relied on the public feast sometimes for the, their only source of meat, these public feasts. Also, many, of course, participated in social meals with their Gentile neighbors. And, of course, all of that virtually would be eliminated for fear of sinning by eating polluted meat. So this was no small issue. It was a big issue to impact their entire lives. So it was necessary and wise and compassionate for Paul to address it the way he addresses it. And, of course, he addresses it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So this is God's counsel on this particular issue. Now, regarding this point, in this passage, Paul makes a few key points. And I just want to point them out to you again, as I did last week, so that you know what's ahead. First of all, he says an idol is nothing. An idol is nothing. Therefore, meat sacrificed to an idol has been sacrificed to nothing. In other words, it's a non-issue. Don't make it an issue. Christians are free in Christ to eat meat sacrificed to idols. Actually, Christians now are free in Christ to eat anything that doesn't harm the body. Food is not an issue. We'll see that. It's not an issue with God. So Christians are free in Christ, then we're free to eat meat sacrificed to idols. However, and this is Paul's main point, Christians are not free to offend a brother or a sister in Christ whose conscience is offended at the thought or at the sight of a Christian eating meat sacrificed to idols. In other words, take care for your Christian brothers or sisters, even though you have the freedom in Christ to do this. Your freedom in Christ is not the primary issue. The glory of God is the primary issue. And helping other Christians, weaker Christians is how Paul puts it in the English text, helping them not to sin, not to violate their own consciences. 
more significantly, Christians are not free to encourage a weaker brother or a sister to violate his or her conscience by eating meat sacrificed to idols. That would be to encourage them to sin, sin against their own conscience, which means it would constitute sin to them. And in that case, then, both would be sinning. The Christian would be sinning and encouraging another brother or sister in Christ to violate his or her conscience. You, you follow the principle there? Okay, that's where we're going with this. Now, please follow along as I read the passage. I'm reading out of the New American Standard. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 13. Now, concerning things sacrificed to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. If anyone supposes that he knows anything, he is not yet known as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by him. Therefore, concerning the things, therefore, concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols, we know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world, and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through him. However, not all men have this knowledge, but some being accustomed to the idol until now eat food as if it were sacrificed to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. But food will not commend us to God. We are neither the worse off if we do not eat, nor the better if we do eat. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone sees you who have knowledge dining in an idol's temple, will not his conscience, if he is weak, be strengthened to eat things sacrificed to idols? For through your knowledge, he who is weak is ruined, the brother for whose sake Christ died. And so by sinning against the brethren and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. There's a lot in there. There's a lot in there. But in that passage, primarily, Paul teaches us what it means to prefer one another in love as it relates to that specific issue of eating meat sacrificed to idols. But again, the principles go way beyond that historical context or that religious setting. The very broad principles of preferring one another in love. But let's take a look at the passage, beginning at verse 1. And I've titled this, The Divine Standard of Love. The Divine Standard of Love. But before he introduces that, he talks about the perversion of knowledge. This is verse 1. Now, concerning the things sacrificed to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge makes arrogant. Now, this isn't knowledge in general. This is a statement about their kind of knowledge. See, apparently, now we, we've seen that a number of things that Paul addresses in 1 Corinthians were a response to a list of questions that congregation had sent to him. And that's why he says, now, concerning things, sacrifice to idols. He didn't just come up with that. They had asked about it. And apparently, uh, this is sanctified speculation on my part, because when he says, concerning things, sacrifice to idols, um, we know that we have knowledge. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself here. But anyway, it, it's not clear precisely what the issue was in terms of how they, how they said it. Let me put it that way. How they addressed it with him because we don't have their list. I'm assuming from the text that they said something to the effect, listen, Paul, we have knowledge. We know that we can eat anything now. Um, we're not bound by the dietary restrictions. So what are we supposed to do with these weaklings who make an issue out of eating meat sacrificed to idols? I, I'm assuming it came across something like that because Paul responds in what seems to be not slightly sarcastic, but sarcastic. I'll show you what we mean. Now, concerning things sac sacrificed to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Yeah, we know, guys, we know that we all have knowledge. Probably quoting back to them what they said to him. That's why he says knowledge makes arrogant. 
that kind of knowledge makes one arrogant. And he knew that because we've already seen in 1 Corinthians that there was so much infighting in that congregation. Well, I'm of Paul, I'm, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Apollos, well, I'm of Jesus, and all of these factions going on. So it would have been consistent with their mindset, their sinful mindset, to, to, to look with scorn upon weaker brothers and sisters whose consciences weren't yet free to partake of meat sacrificed to idols. But in whatever way they said it, they said it in such a way that Paul responds this way. He says, we know we all have knowledge. Again, the precise meaning of that statement is unclear. But I do think it's sarcastic. It's a sarcastic response to what they said and how they said it. Paul's response, in effect, says, your, yours, your knowledge, your knowledge is arrogant literally puffed up. And it's arrogant because it lacks love. That's his point. That kind of knowledge puffs up. But love will keep you from puffing up. In other words, love edifies is what he says. If anyone supposes that he knows anything, he is not yet known as he ought to know. That level of knowledge demonstrates that you don't really know what you're talking about. You don't get it. He's reprimanding them. He's correcting them. Because they are missing the priority of love. Your kind of knowledge puffs up when you should be building up. That's what edify means. Love edifies. It's literally the Greek word is oikodame, which means to build a house. So you can be puffed up or you can build up in love. Right now he's saying you're puffed up. That kind of knowledge is, is counter to anything that the Lord would have you do. Love edifies. Verse 3, but if anyone loves God, he is known by him. There's the standard. God loves you. You claim to love God. That's how you should be treating one another in loving way. That's true loving knowledge, the way God loves you. Now, there's some central issues here, and I want to list them for you. The central issues, first of all, the issue of things sacrificed to idols. We're at verse 4 now. Therefore, concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols, I'll stop there. We tend to think of idolatry, and I, I think it's safe to say that. I don't want to put words into your mouth, but uh, Christians tend to think of idolatry in a very broad sense, anything that is contrary to God or takes the place of God, whether, whether it's an ideology, a worldview, an actual bowing down to a rock or something. We, we don't typically do that, um, I, although some Christians have shrines in their home, and you have to be careful of, of that kind of thing. But... The point here is he's talking about actual man-made material idols that were on display in temples to which people brought and made sacrifices. Okay. So he's using a, a more restrictive uh, definition of idol than, w than what we typically think of it. And we're not thinking of it incorrectly because Paul himself says that certain um, sinful attitudes are idolatry. But here he's talking about actual idols. And so that's why he says, you know, an idol is nothing, verse 4. We know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world and that there is no God but one. Now, he knew there were many idols. In fact, he goes on to say that. But what he's saying is these idols are nothing. They can do nothing. They were made by sinful men. They can't help you. They can't harm you. They can't speak. Nothing. There's, there is nothing of substance there. Therefore, meat sacrifice to them is a non-issue. That's where he's going with this. We know that there's no such thing as an idol in the world and that there is no God but one. Now, elsewhere, Paul links idols with demons. But here he doesn't make that link. He's just saying that idols that are sacrificed to 
the idol itself is nothing. But our God, our Lord, they are everything. That's the contrast he's drawing here. Verse 5 and 6. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father from whom are all things, and we exist for him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through them. What's he saying? Or through him. In other words, despite the prevalence of idolatry, Christians know the true God and the true Lord, Jesus Christ. And Christians know the purpose of their own existence. We exist for him, is for his glory. And Christians know the source of their physical and eternal life. We exist through him, Jesus Christ. He's the creator of all things. And he is the redeemer. Our physical life, our spiritual life, are all sourced in him. We have the truth. Idols have nothing. They have nothing to offer. Another central issue is violating one's conscience. This is important for all of us. Verse 7, however, not all men have this knowledge. Not everyone understands that they're free in Christ uh, to eat meat sacrificed to idols or to do certain other things. But here it's the meat issue. Not all men have this knowledge, but some, being accustomed to the idol until now, in other words, believing in the idol, having worshipped the idol perhaps all of their lives, that residue is still in them. That theological baggage is still there, even though they are Christians. Well, I think we all understand that. All of us, especially if we, come, if we came to the Lord later in life, have baggage, whether, whether it's... Um, really bad experiences, whether it's, um, I don't know, and, and something that we thought, well, by nature I do this, and it's not nature, it's sin, um, memories that, that are painful, just all kinds of things that we bring to our Christian experience. These believers were bringing not an allegiance to idol worship, but a fear of violating God through anything that has anything to do with idolatry. Not all men have this knowledge, but some being accustomed to the idol until now eat food as if it were sacrificed to an idol and their conscience being weak is defiled. If they do that, if you violate your conscience, if they violate their conscience and eat meat sacrificed to idols when they know in their heart it's wrong to do that, even though it isn't inherently wrong, they think it's wrong. Therefore, they're willing to do something they think is wrong. Therefore, that is sin to them. That's a general principle we all need to be aware of. Even though something is permissible, even though something may be great in this life, if we think it's wrong and we do it anyway, to us it's sin. That's one of the principles he's dealing with. Don't violate your own conscience. And be very careful not to violate the conscience of a brother or a sister. Oh, come on. You, you can't really believe that, that God doesn't like that, that God doesn't permit that. Obviously, he permits it. There's nothing in the Bible to keep you from doing this, so go ahead and do it. That would be doing exactly what Paul is rebuking these people for doing, encouraging a brother or sister in Christ to do something that may be neutral in itself but to violate their own conscience in doing it. Because to them, it's sin, and therefore I'm sinning and encouraging a brother or sister to sin. You, you follow that? That's a very important principle to understand. We, we, we have to guard one another very carefully. So the issue here, the central issue, is violating one's conscience. Another central issue. Oh, incidentally, defiled. His conscience is defiled. Um, defiled is, is what happens when someone violates their own conscience. It has to do with fear. It has to do with shame. It has to do with guilt. It has to do with, with the assumption that I have sinned against God. Again, it doesn't matter if what that person did was in and of itself a sin. Actually, we're talking about things that aren't sinful. But to them, if it's sinful, 
then it becomes sin if they're willing to do it anyway. All right, another central issue. And this is God's view of food in general and food sacrifice to idols in particular. Food itself is a neutral issue with God. That's what Paul says, verse 8. Food will not commend us to God. We are neither the worse if we do not eat nor the better if we do eat. Food isn't an issue. One's view toward food, one's presuppositions or things they bring to that meal becomes the issue because it has to do with the heart. It has to do with one's willingness to sin or not to sin in partaking of food. But the food itself is like idols. It's, it's neutral. For the Hebrew people under the Old Testament covenant, as, as you very well know, there were many dietary restrictions built into their worship and built into their culture. And that's part of the, I say baggage, I don't like that word, but, but part of the history that these people bring to them into their Christianity and maybe a lifetime of submitting to the Jewish laws that now has to be relearned. However, for Christians, whether Jewish or Gentile, under the new covenant, there are no restrictions except that one not violate his or her conscience in what he or she eats. That's the only restriction. Give you some examples. Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. Paul writing says, No one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. I mean, th those are things God instituted in the Old Testament. Things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. All of those things pictured Christ. Christ came, and they are the shadow. They're, it's like, you know, all the time I was in Vietnam, I had a picture of my fiance. And I came back from Vietnam, and she was waiting there, and I ran off the plane, and I grabbed that picture, and I just hugged it, man. No, I didn't. Because I had the real thing right in front of me. You, you, you get the picture. The new moon, the Sabbath, all of that was a picture of Jesus Christ. Don't cling to it. That's much of what the book of Hebrews is about. Don't go back to it. Don't cling to it. You know, Dennis, don't hug that picture. She's here. You know, embrace Christ. He's the fulfillment of the picture. He's the reality. That, that's the point. And that's what Paul is saying, in effect, in Colossians chapter 2. In 1 Timothy, Paul again, writing to Timothy, chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, the Spirit explicitly says that in latter times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. Men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude, for it is sanctified by means of the word of God and prayer. That was two, last two verses have to do with food. Have you ever wondered why we say grace before we eat? Well, because we're, we understand that everything we have comes from God, but this verse frames it. Theologically, it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. We're receiving it because God provided it and because it is free for us to do so with gratitude. So those are two passages that deal with the fact that New Testament believers were free to eat anything, really, that didn't harm their bodies. Another central issue, this is the last issue I'll, I'll point out has to do with one's heart attitude, and this is where we really come down to where we live. One's heart attitude. Food is not an issue to God. However, one's heart attitude is a major issue with God. I'll give you an example. This is from Romans 14, 5 and 6. It's going to sound very much like 1 Corinthians chapter 8. It's something of a summary. He says, One person regards one day above another, Another regards every day alike. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day, observes it for the Lord. 
he who eats does so for the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. And he who eats not for the Lord, he does not eat and gives thanks to the Lord. That may sound a little confusing, but the point is uh, contemporary. You have a church that meets on Saturday. Why do they meet? To worship the Lord. That's why they meet. Well, but we worship on Sunday because that was a pattern of the New Testament. And, and it's, it just seems wrong to worship on Saturday. No, the issue here is, the point is, they're worshiping God and he receives that. We're worshiping God and he receives it. So, so don't bicker over that. God is the one who's being glorified as it should be. Now here he's talking about eating meat. Now some people don't eat meat sacrificed to idols. Uh, it violates their conscience. That's fine. They're doing that because they love the Lord and they don't want to offend him. Others see their freedom and they go ahead and eat. Why? Because they're praising the Lord. They have freedom in, in Christ to enjoy this. Don't make an issue of it. But again, coming back to the point, you who have the freedom and have the knowledge, don't cause a brother or sister to sin because of your knowledge, because of your freedom in Christ. And even if it means don't eat there, and that's what Paul comes down to, don't eat there. He said, if I, if I don't, don't eat meat the rest of my life, that's fine. It's not a command by Paul, it's an example because he's preferring others to that extent. I'm getting ahead of myself again, but that's the hard attitude that God is after. Now, some guiding principles. First of all, guard your example. Here's the principle, verse 9. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. We are responsible to help guard the conscience of a weaker brother or sister. In other words, those who do not yet understand their liberties in Christ. Now, this doesn't mean that, well, then we can't do anything because some Christian somewhere is going to be offended. No, when you're with somebody, you have a responsibility to watch out for them, to help guard their conscience. It doesn't mean that, well, here's a, here's a Christian organization online that says, you know, we're really offended at such and such, so Christians shouldn't do that because they're going to offend somebody online. No, that's not it at all. This is personal responsibility to those Christians. I have a responsibility to you. There are things I won't do that if, if I were by myself, I might do in terms of, I don't know, now I've really set myself up for trouble because I have to tell you what I'm talking about. I don't have anything, yeah, you're back, okay, mm, all right. Yeah. I don't have anything in mind. I, I'll give you an example, though, in, well, it could be an example here, too, but in San Ynez, where, where we lived before coming here in, in California, there is a, a shoe mask casino. And we've been told that they have really nice, cheap buffets there. We really like nice, cheap buffets. We would never go there. We would never go there. Why? Because somebody who has an issue in their past, some Christian, with gambling, or that whole thing is anathema to them, is, is way off limits because of their hypersensitive conscience, might see us and be offended. But more critically, might see us say, well, the pastor and his wife go there, so, okay, I'll go there, and violate their own conscience. See, now we're back where Paul is talking about. It's not a sin to go there. I mean, I, I, could, I could extrapolate that and say, oh, that whole industry, I don't want to support it. But anyway, just in, on the surface, it's not a sin to go to a buffet, but it would be sinful for us to do something that would cause another brother or sister in Christ to say, okay, they did it, so I'll go ahead and do it too in violation of their own conscience. You, you follow that? So we need to be very careful um, not to do that. So we just said, oh, we'll, we'll just not go there, period. You know, that, that kind of an illustration. Where the guiding principles, guard your example is the point. Paul gives an illustration in verse 10. For if someone else sees you 
who have knowledge dining in an idol's temple, will not his conscience, if he is weak, be strengthened to eat things sacrificed to idols? It's very interesting. The word translated strengthened is the same word translated edify or kadame. You actually are negatively strengthening someone to sin. So you can build someone up in a, in a negative way too if you encourage them to violate their own conscience. But he says, don't do that, verse 10. Another guiding principle is guard your brother's holiness. Guard your brother's holiness. A brother or sister's holiness is infinitely more important than our Christian liberties. So we don't want to lead them into sin, is the point. Verse 11, for through your knowledge, he who is weak is ruined, the brother who's for whose sake Christ died. He's at, this puts it where it belongs. Jesus Christ sacrificed to the point of death for this person's salvation. We then should be willing to sacrifice to the point of giving something up, probably temporarily, to help guard their holiness. Okay. Christ died for this person. Um, what does it mean by the weak person is ruined? Well, it doesn't mean they lose their salvation. He says, for through your knowledge, he who is weak is ruined. The brother for whose sake Christ died. This is a Christian brother. And the point is Christ died, made the ultimate sacrifice for this Christian brother. So don't damage his or her conscience or his or her witness or his or her assurance because of what you eat or because of something else you do that leads them into sin. So his salvation is not the issue here. His confidence, his conscience, his assurance, his peace of mind, those are the issue. Another guiding principle, don't allow your liberty in Christ to become a sin against Christ himself. Verse 12, and so by sinning against the brethren and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. A principle here is to sin against a uh, a believer is to sin against Christ himself. Paul learned that dramatically on the road to Damascus. Why are you persecuting me, Saul? I've never met you, Jesus. He didn't say that, but I'm sure he was saying it. How did I do that? By persecuting the brothers, you persecute me. That, that's the principle. We don't want to offend another brother or sister in Christ because by doing so, we a sin against Christ himself. Now here's a parallel passage, and this is the passage I will end with. It's Romans 14, verses 14 through 17. Paul says, very similar to what we've seen here. I know and am convinced in the Lord Jesus Christ, nothing is unclean in itself. But to him who thinks anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. That's the principle even if it isn't sinful, if you think it's sinful and you're willing to do it anyway, to you it's sin. He goes on. For if because of food your brother is hurt, you are no longer walking according to love. Do not destroy with your food him for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let what is for you a good thing be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And then Paul gives a final guiding principle, verse 13. And I've titled this, Develop a Pattern of Preference. Develop a pattern, a lifestyle of preference. Verse 13, therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. As I said earlier, that's not a command. That's an example. It's an expression of how highly Paul held the priority of guarding a fellow believer's spiritual well-being. It might even be hyperbole, you know, exaggeration for the sake of emphasis. But it shows that he was willing to make whatever sacrifices necessary to prevent causing another believer to sin. We close with that. Uh, we've seen, and I've, I've, I've given the principles over and over and over again. 
Now, when we come to the Lord's table, we have before us the greatest examples, illustration of preferring one another in love in all of human history. Jesus Christ, God in human flesh, set aside the glories of heaven, took upon himself human flesh, perfect human flesh, came to earth, lived a perfect life, ministered, as you know, uh, made sacrifices, many sacrifices along the way, as you know. But the ultimate sacrifice is what we celebrate this morning, the fact that he shed his precious blood so that we might have salvation. And we've just gone through uh, the season that I love, and you probably do too, of, of Good Friday, or the Passion Week, and then that cross on Good Friday, and then the glory of the resurrected Lord on what we call Easter morning. And now the ascended Lord interceding for us, keeping that way to the Father open. He will never close it for us. Jesus said, all whom the Father gives me, I will raise up on the last day. I will lose none. In John chapter 10, he says, he said, I'm paraphrasing here, but he just envisioned the Father's hand and the Son's hand and the believer is right there safely in the hands of the Father, in the hands of the Son, who says, I will never leave you or forsake you. I will never turn you away. I will raise you up on the last day. The security of your salvation is not in your hands. It's in their hands. And we glory in that. If it were in our hands, we would surely lose it because of our rebellious, even as Christians, even as strong, mature Christians, the rebellious baggage that is still there because we're not yet glorified. We're not yet fully sanctified. But our salvation, our security is not based in our performance. It's based in the Father and the Son. So now we celebrate the fact, or actually the price of our salvation once again. What I would like to do in the next few minutes, I want to give you a time of, of silent prayer between you and the Lord. When we come to the Lord's table, it really is a sacred time. It's a time, Paul said, examine yourselves to be sure you're in the faith. It's a time of right self-examination to see if there's anything in our hearts, in our lives, that is standing between you and communion with the Father, communion with the Son. We, we all have sinned. I say that not because I know you and say you're a sinner, because Scripture says that. We are not yet perfect. Um, it's like Peter and Jesus, before he was crucified, washed his disciples' feet, and, and Peter said, you're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part in me. And typically Peter said, well, then give me a bath, my head and my feet and everything. And Jesus said something very important. He who is cleansed needs only to have his feet washed. That is a picture theologically, spiritually, of the believer, and we are cleansed. If we walk, walk in the light as he is in light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ does what? Cleanses us from all unrighteousness. That's 1 John chapter 1. Okay. Believers are cleansed, but then he goes on to say, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. What does that mean? If we're cleansed, why do we need to confess? Because of that relationship. He doesn't kick us out of the family when we sin. We're still cleansed legally. But we need to take care of that relationship. Loving parents, you understand. When a child sins against you, you don't normally kick them out of the family. But that relationship has been hindered. It may be badly. And it's very important for that child to come back and say, Mom, Dad, I, I'm so sorry. That restores the relationship. Confessing our sins is a very serious way of saying, Father, I'm, I'm so sorry. 
home forgiveness, restoring that relationship. So I want to give you time to do that if, if necessary to do that or just to use it as a few minutes to silently praise the Lord, prepare your heart, and then I will give you specific instructions on how we're going to deal with the elements, okay? But first, just a, a few minutes of silent prayer between you and the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to pray and to evaluate, to seek restoration of our relationship with you. It's wonderful that you do not reject us when we sin. It's wonderful that you receive us as we repent. It's wonderful that you are completely trustworthy and that what you have begun in your children you will bring to completion father i pray that if there are any here this morning who do not love you who do not love your son who have not sought forgiveness who have not come to you in humble submission seeking forgiveness for their sins acknowledging their sinful mess that this would be the morning of their salvation and that you would do a deep and abiding work in them through the gospel by granting them faith, by granting them repentance, by granting them um, restoration into a relationship with you that was lost because of sin. But Father, for those of us whom you have graciously redeemed, we worship you as we worship your son and we praise you as we praise your son through this celebration. In his name I pray. Amen. Amen. We have on the table. Um, <laughs>